From startup to VC, live Q&A with George Robson, partner at Sequoia Capital, moderated by Anastasia Karpova, deputy editor-in-chief at Forbes Russia. My name is Anastasia Karpova. I'm deputy editor-in-chief and head of Forbes on the 30 at Forbes Russia. And I'm excited to welcome you here on Q&A session with George Robson, partner at Sequoia Capital, one of the most powerful VC firms in the world. I think every single founder in the world dreams of getting investment from Sequoia. Hi, George. Thank you for being here. Pleasure to be here. You're too kind. <laughs> A judge is a fintech expert, and prior to joining Sequoia, he was one of the early team at Revolut. We're going to have 30 minutes, and we're going to talk about startups, pitches, and fundraising. So, George, you've just finished listening to the pitches in Venture Lounge, and I'm sure you have hundreds of pitches every single day. From your experience, what are the key mistakes founders make in their pitches usually? I think um, it's important to remember that when we have time together, right, part of it is obviously to get to know you as a founding team and to understand in particular, where does that unique insight come from in terms of why you as a talented individual, a talented group um, are spending your time and energy solving this problem, right, over millions of other things you could be doing. So actually, I think it's critical to really focus and allocate time on the problem statement and think pretty deeply about the way the world works today where your unique insight comes from, from experience, from things you've read, you may have studied, brought together as a group, and just articulate this view of the world that you want to create through your product and through your business, and just being very thoughtful about that. Thank you. Uh, and what do you like about the pitches you've listened today? Yeah, I think one thing we talk a lot about inside of Sequoia when, when we listen to companies is what is the scale of your ambition? Right? I think it's very important that you're clear in terms of not just the market you're going after and the services you're trying to provide today, but actually in its entirety, if this goes right, if you execute on plan, if you scale effectively, what are you going to do to change how consumers and businesses live their lives? And what we saw today actually was that attempt to do it not just across different geographies, but actually across sectors in some of the world's biggest problems of like financial services and logistics and thinking about building a super app for, for groceries and things like that. And that stays in your imagination because they're huge problems to solve. Uh, and how do you select the startups in Sequoia? I'm sure you have like hundreds of startups every single day. And so many founders want to, to get the, the investment from you. So we, I mean, we're fortunate um, because we have you know, a range of different funds. We partner with companies from the earliest stages, from the seed stage, right through to, you know, pre-IPO and beyond, actually, and across geographies as well. You're right. We see a pretty broad mix of businesses that, that we work with and partner with. I think in reality, what we really care about is the uniqueness of the insight, as I said, in terms of how does the world work today? How do you and the team plan to change that? And really getting an understanding of like, I think great founding teams have four things broadly, right? They have domain expertise and understanding around a particular area or a particular market. They have functional expertise in the group that they've built and they've brought on board, whether it's in product or go to market or operations, whatever it is that your core business actually needs to win. They have determination, right? They have evidence over their lives, not just their professional careers, but their education, their childhoods, um, some evidence that they've been able to persevere, right? And to succeed over time. And then they have luck, right? And part of that is obviously being somewhere in the right point in time and having this why now for why should you be founding this business today? Why could somebody not have done this two years ago? Thank you. Uh, and you also have entrepreneurial experience. So how do you use your personal entrepreneurial experience and, and your fintech experience in your VC career? Yeah, it, um, it, it, it definitely helps. I think the, there are a couple of ways that it helps for sure. One is actually just around empathy. I think understanding that when you push out to found a company and you take a risk, right? Your parents ask you what you're doing. Your friends say, what are you building? They've never heard of your business. It would be easier for you to go and collect a salary at a bigger company where you have benefits and you have comfort. Obviously, you push out a little bit onto the unknown to try and create something from nothing. That is the heroic piece, right, of the entrepreneurial journey. I think the reality of that is just having deep empathy with that problem and understanding that people are working hard to try and build a better world um, is actually the privilege of, of, of my new role, but actually of kind of entrepreneurship more generally. 
But I think secondly to that, like we have a, a working model at Sequoia where actually we work together as a team with our companies. You have somebody you work with the most day to day, but you probably work with you know three or four of our partners on a pretty frequent basis. And the reason we do that is increasingly different models are kind of seeping from a sector into another sector. When you think about like the emergence of SaaS in enterprise, right, coming from consumer where subscriptions have existed for a long time, just sharing those learnings across different people who've worked in different sectors is important. And in a world where fintech is increasingly embedded in, to be honest, most industries, right, payments is an important part of most businesses. Um, I find myself working with much more than just financial services companies about how to build that future. Thank you. And why, why is it fintech? Uh, I had an interview with Olga Shikansova. Mm. Uh, she joined you in the previous session. Yeah, uh, she's great. She, yeah, she was telling me about how fintech appeared in her life and how it was for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I was um, in London um, working in Canary Wharf and I just saw friends of mine, you know, using this new app called Revolut. And the initial tagline was this idea of spend abroad without fees. Right. It was challenging you if you were somebody who lived a multi-currency lifestyle for whatever reason, right, friends, family, work, to use this product as a way to allow you to reduce inefficiency, save money and live a more efficient financial life. But I think the interesting thing for me kind of going to Revolut and seeing what we built as, as a platform and the product evolved is actually we had lots of users that were financially aspirational, right? people who wanted to learn more about how to consume more financial services products, but not necessarily yet financially sophisticated. And I think what we're really seeing at the moment is consumers and more recently, actually businesses and particularly SMBs going through this kind of awakening where actually there's a level of awareness now of what you can do with software and with financial services software specifically, just to make your lives or your business much more efficient and give you back control, right, over the way you manage your money. And that is now spread across, you know, all verticals and all in all geographies. And it's now this global phenomenon of really, you know, the last five years and for sure the next 15 to 20 years. Uh, thank you. And let's get back to, um, to fundraising. So what advice should first time founders hit? Yeah, I think, I, think, I think that's an awesome question. I think to remember, like my view of, of companies broadly, is that it's like millions of decisions that you make in a certain order that lead to a certain outcome, right? That's really what over time defines your business. And the reality is that most of those decisions that you will make aren't unique just to you, right? Unless you're you know, necessarily Elon Musk, right, going to Mars. The reality is that most companies have made the tough decision of, should we launch in market A or market B? When should we hire our first product marketing manager? How should we think about pricing? Should we rebrand now or in six months, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They might not have made that decision in your sector, in your geography, right? But people exist in the world that can give you advice and guidance and help you get your business to that next phase. So in my experience, you know, the only difference between first time founders and more recent founders is obviously experience, right? And a lot of that experience exists. You just need to ask for it. And you should do that not just with your investors, whoever they are, right? You should expect them to really support you and help you, you know, work out some of these questions. But the reality is that working at Sequoia, like, we don't really tell people what to do, right? Because we often don't know the answer. But what we do do and where we can help is we can show people what we think good may look like, right? Or at least we can direct somebody to a great person in our portfolio who's doing what you're doing at a slightly bigger scale and slightly further on to help you try and manage that and resolve it. So just ask, have a low ego and just ask for advice. In your opinion, what makes a good founding team? I think deep intellectual honesty. Like I think the reality is when you're running an early stage business, clearly not everything is perfect, right? You're at a point in the journey in building whatever vision it is you have, right, for your product. Things won't always work. Things of it will work today. That's how you're getting the early traction while your early customers are there. But a lot of it is about having a very realistic view of the world in terms of what you are doing well, where you need to improve, where you need support and help, and a you know, better person maybe in that role or a bigger team or whatever it might be as a founding team, making those tough decisions. And you can't get there if you don't have this intellectual honesty. It makes it very difficult. So actually, you know, the best teams are honest with each other. They're very honest with us as a, as a partner, right, in supporting you in the company. And they're very open 
to iterating on those different assumptions over time as you hopefully move towards a successful path. Mm -hmm. You worked Drevolute, so with Nick Stronsky, who is, in my opinion, one of the yes. best founders. And you also meet a lot of founders every single day. So what do you think? Uh, do they have something in common, these outstanding founders like Nick and many others? So yeah, maybe, maybe just talk a little bit about that. I mean, I, like, I joined Revolut in large part because of Nikolai. Right? Nick has this, to, to use my, like, the point, like an incredible view of the world in terms of how, how financial services will work. And actually Nick's incredible you know, ability is actually through product and through design to really work with the team to realize that. And when you work with somebody like that and you see someone that you just believe is a winner, right, who will work incredibly hard and drive people forwards to get the best out of them, it's both like pretty uplifting and quite influential on the culture that you build around it, on how teams are structured, how they work, how performance is measured inside the business. So you learn a lot from, from observing that kind of thing, I guess, up close. But what I'd say is that obviously the way that you um, communicate that to the world can be quite different depending on your personality. Like I think it is it is wrong to assume that everybody has to look or, or work like a Nikolai or, or, or like anybody else, right? It's about being true to how it is you like to work, how you like to manage people, how you what your communication style is to make sure that you are being a true version of yourself, to be honest, because that's what people look to you as as a founder is to carry the culture and define the culture, right, over time. So I think that like what I would say for founders, there is a there is a level of obviously intimacy and understanding about the problem, which really should best come from the founder, a very deep knowledge of that and the of that knowledge base. But I would say as much as anything else, just humility and a willingness to improve and to understand that like when you look at these amazing CEOs and you listen to podcasts and you read books, this is you catching people at a point in the journey, right? And everybody has gone through probably multiple evolutions, right? As the business has evolved and as they made this transition from being a founder to a CEO, right? Which is a very different role. And just remembering that and remembering that you're also on that point in the journey and improvement is the only thing that's going to keep driving you forwards. Thank you. So you actually changed careers. So you left startup and went to the uh, VC firm. So mm -hmm. what's your personal investment philosophy on in this role so in sequoia yeah so so i i moved relatively recently i moved in september when we opened our new office at sequoia which is exciting because it's the next chapter of sorts right where we're hoping to be closer to european founders earlier in the journey who are going out to build these enduring companies i think the interesting piece for me is when i think about my experience at Revolut, really what we were doing is it was a relatively small team or at least you know when i joined of people who were outsiders to financial services. You know, Nikolai had been a, you know, a trader, but he hadn't built a bank, right? It was a very different skill set. But it was people who were, again, very intellectually honest about what they could do, who had an ambition to disrupt one of the world's biggest industries for the better, right, obviously. And the reality of what I do at Sequoia is, is actually not that different to much of that, right? And that we work with, part, like we partner with companies from the earliest stages Um, we like to work with people that want to create these generational companies that will matter in 15, 20, 25 years time, which means they need to be attacking a problem of enough scale and enough significance that it will change the way consumers and businesses live their lives. So the funny piece is that is not very different. Obviously, the way that we work together and the way we collaborate is a little bit different, um, but actually still getting into the weeds on products and finding people who deeply care about the problem matters. Great. So we have a question from the viewer. Uh, what are the main features of good candidate for your new seed program? Yeah, absolutely. So, so maybe just to talk about that. So, so we recently closed a new seed fund, um, which was exciting. Um, but it's actually no different to how Sequoia has been working for 50 years with early stage companies. And what I mean by that is, you know, Sequoia partners with companies more at pre-seed and seed than at any other stage. Um, we do that across all regions and we support companies in a couple of key ways. One is obviously financing and looking to help support the business get off the ground. Um, often that is definitely pre-revenue, pre-product and sometimes even pre-incorporation, right? So really we will happily be the first partner you have to launch your business. But two, 
it's in the, some of the working model we have within Sequoia, where not only we have this kind of team ethos, where a lot of our partners are supporting our portfolio companies with acute kind of functional problems as they're scaling, but also we have this program that we run called our company design program, where we actually have classes of Sequoia founders that come onto Sequoia at the kind of seed series A and, and, and at the growth stage. And the idea of that is as much really to do with community, right? And this idea that you will have ideas how to solve some problems that others can't, right? Or can't currently, you can support them and vice versa. So the best bet really is to address those five points, as I said, to contact us, right? And to not be afraid to do it this early in the journey because we understand that early is, you know, the product might not be there yet. You're still involved in the thinking. We can, we can be a good partner for you. And then know that if we can work together, we'll be a good partner for you. Thank you. And I have a couple of questions from myself as well. Yeah. So you, you actually mentioned the pandemics. So what do you think, how did the pandemic change the world of venture capital and startups globally? So I think the thing that is most exciting is I think it's leveled the playing field in a couple of ways. I think it's made it, I think it's brought down the perceived barrier in terms of being able to work with companies across borders. I think that the reality is you can be based really anywhere, right? And be a great partner. Um, I think the second thing is around talent, not just kind of remote work, but I think it's changed the question of, you know, internal culture within a team. What does it mean to be in an office environment? Things like this. And I think that that means that actually for you to build a remote first business from very early on or day one of your company is now much more believable. Um, and actually that means that you can find this greater pool of specialist talent to support you. So I think that actually it's been net positive for many businesses, um, depending on the obviously technology component of what they do. Some sectors have clearly struggled, right? We've seen that in our portfolio and some of our founders have had to take quite tough decisions to support on that. Um, but hopefully, right, as the world starts to emerge, we will be in a stronger position where, you know, normal life will look normal, but also some of these advantages of being able to found a company from anywhere, hire from anywhere will remain. Did you change your investment strategy during the pandemic? Um, so not so much, actually. Um, I mean, the, like the mission statement for, for Sequoia is that we really want to partner with founders that we think are building enduring businesses. And our timeline for what it will take to build an enduring company is measured in really decades, right? It will often take 10, 15, even 20 years for some of these companies to emerge. So the reality is it's something like a pandemic that we you know, hoped would be over in a, in a shorter time frame than that. And cautiously, it looks like it might be, um, actually means that, you know, we're really looking for these generational companies and that's a much longer time frame. So, so not so much. Yeah. Thank you. And what do you think of the future of FinTech? Yeah, I think, I think there's a few things that are really exciting me at the moment. I think that, um, this evolution towards embedded finance, which has been discussed for a couple of years, but I think is really starting to gain traction. Specifically, the idea that you know non-fintech companies, i.e. in retail or healthcare or even mobility and other things like this, will really start to think about more than just processing payments, which is really kind of a level one service, but actually starting to think a little bit more constructively about holding balances, providing other layers of financial services products on top of that to a world where consumers will you know, consume finance at the edge, where they shop, where they live their lives, not necessarily where their money is stored, i.e. within their bank. So I'm very excited about that. I'm very, very excited about some of the applications within DeFi to just remove frictions of managing money across borders, having access to financial services products not available in your geography, just because of this very global aspect to a lot of these protocols. Um, so I think that we are getting a more global world with a better range of services consumed in more places. And that gives me great excitement. Thank you. And I, ha I think I have my last question. Could you please share some pitching life hacks for, for startups? So uh, less is more, I think. Um, really think carefully about the questions you're being asked and you know, working with the person you're speaking to that you're pitching to, to make sure that you can get through the key topics. I think demos help. If you're at a point where you can really start to frame, right, what you're building with something of a live demo, even if it's a prototype, right, or it might be a recording of a demo you took earlier, it just really helps to anchor the user experience you're trying to create. Because otherwise, it's, it's, it's words and it's numbers and it's graphs, but it doesn't feel as, as real and as tangible. And then what I would say is, and, and this is maybe obvious, but like, 
it is appreciated always if you say you're going to do something and if people do it, right? Like I think you can really communicate a lot about how you work and how organized you are. You know, follow up, be in the meetings, have the stuff, send the materials early, just communicate how you're this person who's really on top of, right, the running of your business. All these little things. Thank you so much, George, for this amazing discussion. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It was useful. Thank you. Thank you so much.